Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Online coming from St John's Vicarage as usual. It's uh, very good to have you worshipping with me today. This morning we're continuing our journey through the letter of James in the New Testament. And uh, we're on James chapter 4 and it's quite challenging stuff this week I have to tell you. So uh, let's prepare our hearts and open our minds to what the Lord might want to say to us this morning. Let's just be quiet for a moment as we prepare to worship. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Blessed are you, Sovereign Lord, Creator of all. To you be glory and praise for ever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time you made us in your image, and in these last days you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Your spirit ever renew our lives and your praises ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Night has passed and the day lies open before us. So let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our readings today are going to be read by John and then Sally. The reading is taken from the fourth chapter of the book of James. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war with you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder, and you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly, in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says, God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbour? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your own arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it commits sin. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted 
and their rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Listen, the wages of the labourers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts on a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's Gospel is taken from Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and, in, and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. For your name's sake. Amen. So here we are, James chapter four. And remember right back at the start of our series on James, I said that uh, you have to remember when reading James that James isn't Paul, at least that's what Phil told us uh, to remember. Paul wrote in long prose, often with a careful argument that was uh, all worked out and built on what had gone before. Whereas James, it's much more like he's painting a picture and uh, he puts a bit over here and a bit over here and an idea here and then he comes back to that idea and fills it in a little bit more. And um, it can seem like he's jumping around all over the place. Uh, but then when you get to the end of the letter and you step back, you see that there is a beautiful picture. A picture that looks like Jesus, really, his character, his life, the kind of things that he did. And in James chapter 4, James is not pulling his punches. This is the darkest and really it sounds quite harsh, doesn't it? Harshest part perhaps of this letter. 
And sometimes Jesus was stern too. Harsh on sin, harsh on injustice, harsh on pride. Perhaps we could say angry, but angry in the right kind of way. A couple of weeks ago, we saw that John the Baptist was quite uh, firm in what he was saying. We might say harsh, but harsh in his condemnation of sin and injustice. So is there something for us to learn here? In the first few verses of chapter four, James is challenging his readers or his hearers about their level of commitment to God. Are they really devoted to God? Or are they chasing after the things of the world and following the ways of the world, the things that are opposed to God? One of the first books of the Old Testament that I ever read was Hosea. I've been going uh, to a church and I told the curate at the church uh, that I didn't really know my way around the Old Testament at all and I didn't really know where to start. And he said, why don't you start with Hosea? It's such a beautiful book about God's love for us. His wonderful, beautiful love. And so I excitedly bought a commentary on Hosea and I began. But the opening verses weren't quite what I expected. Hosea is told, go marry a promiscuous woman, a prostitute, and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. God is angry at that point in Israel's history and he's angry because the people he loves and have, has pledged himself to have gone off and worshipped other gods, worshipped idols. They've been unfaithful to him. The kind of anger that God feels and expresses is the same kind of anger someone feels when they realise that their spouse has been unfaithful to them. Had to have that feeling, but I suspect most of us know someone who's been on the receiving end of that kind of unfaithfulness, that kind of betrayal. It hurts, it makes you angry. Broken promises, huge pain, often distressed children. Why? because someone who had pledged to love someone to the exclusion of all others broke that pledge and went off after another love. And James is really saying in these opening verses of chapter four, that's what you're doing. That's what causes conflicts and quarrels among you. You're going after the things of the world. You're being unfaithful to God. You're seeking what you want rather than what he wants. Adulterers, he cries in verse 4, and it's exactly the same kind of meaning as in Hosea in the Old Testament. Friendship with the world, says James, is enmity towards God. First commandment for Christians is to love God, love God above all other loves, and to love our neighbour as ourself. We have an enemy who tries to scupper our relationship with God. The devil is the one that sows all the seeds of discontent. He's the one who fans the flame of discontent and lust and covetousness. His whole mission is to mess up our relationship with God. So be aware of him. Be on the lookout for him, for his tactics. Resist him, says James, and he'll flee. And then the other side of the coin, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That verse seems like a beautiful diamond shining out against the darkness of some of the other uh, expressions of evil and selfishness in James chapter four. I did read the whole of Hosea back in 1988 with the help of a commentary. I went through the whole book verse by verse and I did discover in those chapters a truly beautiful description of God's love for his people, his beloved. Because in spite of their waywardness and their unfaithfulness and the pain that that causes in the heart of God, he cannot give up on them. 
How can I give you up, Ephraim, he says. How can I hand you over, Israel? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. He says, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. God's people turn from the idols they've been chasing after. The moment they return to him, he'll be there to embrace them. His arms will be open. Not because their sin doesn't matter or because it didn't cause God pain, but because he loves them so much, he wants them back and he's swift to forgive. If we've strayed from God's ways, if we've neglected our relationship with him, if we've chased after other gods, whatever the gods of this age may be, sex, drugs, alcohol, social media, computer games, power, money, ambition, whatever it is that has got in the way, taken the place that God should have at the top of our priorities. Whatever we've gone after, it's always a short road back to God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And James is saying, purify your hearts, ask God's forgiveness, lament over your sins and see them as the horrible things that they are and humble yourself before God, before Jesus who died on the cross to pay the price for those sins. We really repent when we really seek forgiveness, God lifts us up. From that place, we live for him and according to his ways. And as James goes on to say, that means not speaking evil of or about others, especially other Christians. Remember Phil's sermon last week, how words can be so destructive so hurtful. Even if we disagree on things, we don't have to say hurtful things to each other. Relationships within a church particularly matter. We're called to love each other and even the people that we find difficult. It also means not judging others. Remember Anthony's sermon from James chapter 2 where he said how making a list of all the ways we tend to judge people was one of the easiest lists he's ever tried to create because we just constantly judge people, what they wear, what they eat or drink, what car they drive, what job they do, their lifestyle, so many different things. James is saying, don't judge. Jesus said, don't judge. It's not our place to judge. See people instead as brothers or sisters made in the image of God. Treat them as you would like to be treated yourself. And then don't forget God when you're making plans about your future and what you're going to do with your money. Why? Well, to put it bluntly, he's the one who knows how many days we've got left. And none of us know that. We see it on the news all the time, don't we? People being taken unexpectedly from this earth. We saw it recently with our dear brother Leonard, who just came home from a PCC meeting and then the same night was taken to be with the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, says the writer of Proverbs, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, acknowledge God and he will make your path straight. I remember when I applied for the job here at St John's, I had looked at other jobs, but this was the one that I really wanted. I put in an application and I was pretty hopeful that I'd get shortlisted, I'd at least get an interview. Uh, but then I heard nothing, even though I knew that the day for shortlisting had passed I was crestfallen and I remember going for a long walk along the canal and as I walked I remember saying to God okay well I thought that was the one 
that clearly I was wrong and uh, I only want to go where you want me to go. So wherever that is, just make it clear. I am your servant and I will do your will. And then when I got home, there was an email from Mike saying that Bishop Andrew had been having trouble with his computer and had asked him uh, to tell me that I was, uh, that they'd like me to go for an interview later that week. In hindsight, I'm quite glad that that happened because it took me to a place of complete surrender to God, a place of saying, not my will, but your will be done. Much in this chapter about humility, just being humble before God, knowing that every day we have is a gift from him. The money that we have is really his. It's just for us to ask him what he wants us to do with it. There's a sting in the end of chapter four as well, isn't there? A sting in the tail. And it's to do with sins of omission. Verse 17, anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, commits sin. So it's not just enough to avoid the obvious acts of sin. There is a life to which we're called. And at times that call might be life changing change of job, career, maybe with a massive salary cut, or maybe a call to make a stand on something that could set you apart. A bully that needs to be stood up to. A criminal that needs to be exposed. Or to take heed of the gospel reading Sally read to us today. A hungry person that needs to be fed. A thirsty person that needs to be given a drink naked person who needs to be clothed, a stranger who needs welcoming, someone who's sick or in prison who needs to be visited. But whatever we do for one of the least of these members of God's family, we do for him. But I don't think that means we have to be the answer to every problem in the world. Sometimes it's not for us to do something. Sometimes the call may even be for us not to act or to stop doing something. Obedience to God can sometimes mean taking a break and keeping the Sabbath, which isn't just a good idea, it's a command. It reminds us that God is capable of running the world without our help and because he loves us enough to want us to have a rest and because it creates space for us to draw near to him so that he can draw near to us. Diamond in the darkness, intimacy with God, he loves us with a jealous love and in whose presence we find perfect freedom. Let's pray. Lord, there's so much in this chapter that's challenging, so much that can make us, uh, that can leave us like we fall so far short of the people that you want us to be, to become. And yet, Lord, we thank you so much uh, that your love for us is so great, so swift to forgive. Help us, Lord, to draw near to you, to turn away from anything that mars your image in us. And help us to walk so closely with you, Lord, that uh, that character of Jesus is seen in us. May we reflect him in the world we live in. May we pray in his name. Amen. Let's worship together.
pray together. Almighty God, we're challenged by what we're reading in James, challenged to be a more radical disciple and to a greater devotion to you as our Lord and God. Forgive the poverty of our worship and the ease with which we're drawn away from you by the enticements of the world around us. Help us, Lord, to know you more clearly, love you more dearly and follow you more nearly, that the world might see you through us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church and particularly for the Church of England as it grapples with issues of sexuality and marriage. Give wisdom to all those who serve on synods and to our archbishops and bishops who have seats in the House of Lords. Archbishop Justin has spoken out boldly on issues of immigration and the cruelty of the current proposals. Bishop Stephen has campaigned hard on the dangers of the online world to our young people and the need for better protection. We ask that legislation that's passed will be in line with your will. We're aware too of failures in the church in terms of safeguarding and the ongoing care of victims of abuse. Sanctify your church, Lord, and bring into being the structures and processes that will ensure the safety of all in our church communities. Root out and expose any current wrongdoing and make your church a safe haven and a place of healing. Thank you for all those who are called to a ministry of counselling and pastoral care. May they be channels of your love, wisdom and peace. We pray too for Christians involved in the business community. Thank you for those who use their skills and ingenuity to create products and jobs that drive our economy. May they also be good stewards of the wealth they create and be good employers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our gospel reading today reminded us to care for the hungry and thirsty and for all those in need. Lord, we thank you for the organisations in Reading who do this and who are supported by local churches. We pray for the ministries of Christian Community Action, Ready Food, the churches in Reading Drop-In Centre, Street Pastors and the Mustard Tree Foundation. We ask you to provide all that they need in terms of finances and volunteers and ask that they would be channels of your love to those they serve. And prompt us, Lord, as individuals, if you want any of us to get involved in some way or to give regularly. We also pray for charities and NGOs that work internationally to relieve poverty and suffering. Christian Aid, Tear Fund, Doctors Without Borders and so many more. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Continue to pray for an end to the war in Ukraine for a weakening of the Russian and Belarusian regimes and for a change in leadership that will lead to peace, stability and justice. We pray for peace in Israel and the West Bank, in Syria and in those parts of Africa where tribal and religious conflicts rage. Please bring peace and prosperity to these nations and change the conditions that cause so many to flee and seek asylum in Europe. Bring hope and a brighter future to refugees currently waiting in camps and asylum centres and bring to an end the dangerous sea crossings. Give wisdom and compassion to all those trying to help. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray now for those we need, in, for those we know in particular need today, who we name in our hearts in the silence now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Collect for today. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth 
to the glory of your name. Through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. That concludes our service for today. Thanks so much for being with me. If you're watching this on Sunday morning and you're local and you're mobile, uh, Messy Church is yet to come at the Weller Centre this afternoon, 4 till 6 p.m. today. All are welcome. Do come along, do invite friends if you can get there. If not, I'll see you again next Sunday uh, as we'll be concluding our series on James. Hope you have a great week. Stay close to Jesus and I'll see you next, I'll see you next Sunday. Bye for now. <laughs>